This is the story of a superhero intellectual father-daughter dynamic duo, Michaela and Jordan Peterson. Jordan is a clinical psychologist, author, and public speaker who is one of the few intellectuals that has gained name recognition outside of the world of academia. Michaela is a CEO, podcast host, and health advocate who has defied all odds and overcome a proverbial trail mix of both physical and mental ailments. Although both of them have been mischaracterized to a degree that would make J. Jonah Jameson proud. Spider-Man, hero or menace? Exclusive Daily Bugle photos. Menace? He was protecting that armor. I'll tell you what, Atticus, you take the pictures, I'll make up the headlines, okay? All right? That okay with you? Yes, sir. And ironically, much like the provider of Spider-Man slander, the Petersons' character demolitionists have the exact same business model as the Daily Bugle. So over the course of this video, I hope to combat this misinformation and portray their life philosophies in a way which doesn't distort their message. Oh, would you look at look at that? Jordan was born in the true North Strong and formerly free. And when it comes to clinical psychology, he's like Michael Jordan, because he's the best at what he does. I would have likened him to LeBron James, but Jordan Peterson actually reads the books he's carrying around. So you're holding the autobiography of Malcolm X along with Alex Haley. I don't know how far you are into the book, but what's your biggest takeaway so far? Um, I kind of just started a couple days ago, um, but um, I've read and a lot, of, a lot of notes over the years. Jordan began his career as a professor at McGill University, where he taught from 1985 to 1993, before securing a faculty position at the world's most reputable school. Well, before they shifted their focus from providing a superior education to discriminating against Asians. But anyways, Jordan held his position at Harvard from 1993 to 1998, before he moved back to Canada and has since held tenure at the University of Toronto. Jordan's work has a central focus, ideologies. This is because of a reoccurring dream that was quite literally haunting him. These dreams were violent, centered around the theme of destruction, and always included death on a mass scale. Jordan, as a psychologist hailing from the Jungian school of thought, knew not to take these dreams lightly, because as Carl Jung would tell us, dreams are invariably seeking to express something that the ego does not know or does not understand. Jung also believed that a solution to a personal problem, if properly communicated, could reduce the likelihood of that problem existing in someone else's experience. So, Jordan set out to discover what would have to take place in order to turn him into the worst version of himself. When I see that someone has done something, extreme. I try to imagine what I would have to be like, what kind of situation I would have to find myself in to do that. And believe me, man, that's a horrifying enter that's a horrifying enterprise. Solving what turned his dreams into nightmares by exploring death and tyranny from a personal psychological standpoint resulted in high stakes because Jordan felt if he were to fail to solve the riddle that his dreams were laying out before him, he would at the very least destroy his self-respect and at the most, his sanity. So in 1985, he embarked on the mental journey of a lifetime with the hopes of understanding what steps would have to take place in order to turn him into the worst kind of person on earth, an Auschwitz guard who's capable of carrying out ruthless and murderous orders. And then to carve a mental pathway, which leads us to become the exact opposite. Because while well, yes, it is advised to take our personal growth seriously and focus on our aim. You see where you're going? Mm-hmm. Okay. Now let's worry about how you get there. It's best practice to also know who we don't want to become. Not Slytherin. Not Slytherin. He laid out this mental blueprint in just 564 pages, with his first book titled Maps of Meaning. So, Isn't it ironic? that a man whose life work aims to teach us how to not become Nazis gets called a Nazi and has even been likened to a magical super Nazi? Jordan realized how dense and complex Maps of Meaning was as a book, so he gave himself the challenge of freeing his theory on meaning from the confines of pen and paper and curated an accredited course at the University of Toronto, taught by him, called, well, you guessed it, Maps of Meaning. Now, let's fast forward a few decades to 2013, when a new platform was making waves on the internet, and some of you may have heard of it. This platform is called YouTube. This is where Michaela comes into the picture. Jordan, with the help of his daughter, began posting his lectures to the budding platform. Now, keep in mind, in the early days of YouTube, extremely complex lectures about how to build your life upon a foundation of meaning in order to safeguard us from becoming the worst version of ourselves wasn't exactly in line with the viral trends at the time. 
which Jordan likes to point out was mainly cute kitten videos. Leap another few years into 2016, and Jordan catches wind of Bill C-16, which is starting to be pushed through Canadian Parliament. This is a bill which made the use of preferred pronouns become law, which brought misgendering somebody into the realm of hate speech. Jordan's issue with this bill had nothing to do with the moral use of pronouns. I didn't care if transgender people wanted to be called by some pronouns, like whatever, that's something for individuals to negotiate. Rather, he saw this bill for what it was, a government overstep into legally compelled speech. Remember how his life's work tried to find the dominoes which would need to fall in order to spiral into a state of totalitarianism? Well, an attack on language is the first domino, because as George Orwell would say, if thought corrupts language, language can also corrupt thought. Now I'll admit, when the controversy around Jordan's stance on free speech started making headlines, I was 22. And at that point in my life, I didn't care much, if at all, about public policy. Except, as a mixed martial arts fan, I wasn't opposed to the idea of watching people exchange blows for my own personal entertainment. Except, the seriousness of the issue soon set in and the excitement wore off, because I heard Jordan's message loud and clear. That you see that as a curtailing of freedom? It's worse than a curtailing of freedom. It's a demand that the population uses a certain kind of linguistic approach. It's, a, it's an appropriation of speech. There's no excuse for that. That never has happened once in the history of English common law, right? It's a barrier that we do not cross. Hate speech laws are bad enough. It's not like there's no hate speech. Like anyone with any sense knows that there's hate speech. Who's going to regulate it? Who's going to define it? And I know the answer to that. The last people in the world you would want to. And then we, we cross another barrier and we allow the government to compel speech for some hypothetically compassionate reason? No way. That's a really bad idea. Now, like the rest of the world, the controversy around Bill C-16 was my introduction to Jordan. And I, like so many others, instantly dove into the online catalog of lectures that Michaela was instrumental in helping him curate. And I thought to myself, how can anybody listen to what this man has to say and then attach such wretched labels as misogynist and transphobe to him? Although I've come to realize that's the thing. Anybody that holds these opinions of Jordan hasn't actually listened to him. They've just commandeered the beliefs of a pseudo-journalist and held them as their own. And this is where the issue becomes a lot easier to understand, because journalists commonly use those monikers while tossing headlines of clickbait into the ocean of outrage that is the internet. And these journalists, who are now better thought of as verbal arsonists, are stoking the flames of identity politics, group guilt, and tribalism. So it makes sense that a man who preaches individualism gets burnt by the very institutions that have realized the only thing outselling sex is faux virtuous outrage. Spider-Man won't let me take any more pictures. You've turned the whole city against him. A fact I'm very proud of. Now, get your pretty little portfolio off my desk before I go into a diabetic coma. Now, here's the side of Jordan's philosophies that journalists are afraid to tell you. And at first it might even sound familiar because, well, it's a message that's been spoken by nearly every great philosopher before him. That we wield more power in determining the outcome of our lives than we allow ourselves to believe. Jordan's philosophies quite literally changed my life because, well, when I first stumbled across this man, I'd recently fallen into a well of darkness much like a young Bruce Wayne, and his message about responsibility sparked fear. But much like Bruce and the Bats, it felt like a fear I needed to embrace. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is... I'm Batman. I had a habit of blaming others for the chaos that was ravaging my mind, and Jordan's lectures exposed what was really taking place. Self-imposed mental warfare. Shifting the blame of my misery onto others didn't only not help, but it made things worse. Because I was unconsciously signing off on the fact that I don't have control over not just my emotions, but also my life. And giving myself impunity from responsibility placed me on a long road directed away from happiness. Because admitting to myself that I was my own biggest enemy after I'd convinced myself that the other was to blame for my misery was no easy task. So how do we take responsibility for our lives? Well, Jordan has a concept that has become a viral meme of sorts. Clean your room. And I'd try to explain this concept, but I'm afraid I'd just come off like LeBron talking about Malcolm X. Which is a very, um, very smart man. Very, very, very smart man. So, let's have Jordan himself give us a quick lecture. Uh, I, like the, I like the idea of the room, because you can do that at the drop of a hat. You know, you go back to where you live and sit down and think, okay, I'm going to make this place better for half an hour. What should I do? You have to ask. And 
things will just pop up like mad. And it's partly because your mind is a very strange thing. As soon as you give it a name, a genuine aim, it'll reconfigure the world in keeping with that aim. That, that's actually how you see to begin with. And so if you set it a task, especially, you have to be genuine about it, which is why you have to bring your thoughts and emotions together and then you have to get them in your body so you're acting consistently. You have to be genuine about the aim, but once you aim, the world will reconfigure itself around that aim, which is very strange. And, and it, it's, it's, it's technically true. You know, the best example of that, you have all seen this video where you watch the basketballs being tossed back and forth between members of the white team versus the black team. And while you're doing that, a gorilla walks up into the middle of the video and you don't see it. It's like, you know, if you thought about that experiment for about five years, that would be about the right amount of time to spend thinking about it. Because what it shows you is that you see what you aim at. And that man, if you can get one thing through your head in, as a consequence of even being in university, that would be a good one. You see what you aim at. And so because one inference you might draw from that is, be careful what you aim at, right? It, what you aim at determines the way the world manifests itself to you. And so if the world is manifesting itself in a very negative way, one thing to ask is, are you aiming at the right thing? Now, you know, I'm not trying to reduce everybody's problems to an improper aim. People get cut off at the knees for all sorts of reasons. You know, they get sick, they have accidents. There's a random element to being, that's for sure. But, and so you don't want to take anything, even that particular phrase, too far. You want to bind it with the fact that random things do happen to people. But it's still a great thing to ask. Jordan also taught me how to think freely. And I'm paraphrasing here, but I once heard him say something along the lines of, we can discuss 10 possible outcomes, but that doesn't mean any or all of them have to happen. I used to be unable to entertain ideas that were outside of my realm of comfort, which truly hindered my ability to foresee possible outcomes. And no matter whether it's a personal life decision or a collective policy, it is extremely important to ponder possible outcomes because it's the punch a boxer doesn't see coming that knocks them out, both figuratively and literally. Now I hope you didn't think I was going to give Michaela superhero status just for uploading some YouTube videos, because I think of her as a hero for what she's done for not just herself, but others. Not what she's done for her father. Between the ages of 7 and 22, she was diagnosed with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, depression, bipolar type 2, idiopathic hypersomnia, Lyme disease, psoriasis, and eczema. After countless physical therapy sessions and drug prescriptions had produced lackluster results, Michaela took matters into her own hands and decided to start experimenting with different diets. There was a lot of trial and error, but she stumbled across the carnivore diet, a diet in which you only consume red meat and water. Say what you will, but pounding nothing but red meat remedied what she was told were chronic diseases. So Michaela started blogging about her new and extremely restrictive diet, which she dubbed the lion diet. Her goal was to help people realize that we shouldn't give up on our health, no matter what the doctors tell us. And at the end of the day, it is our responsibility to fix ourselves, which is probably why she also finds herself in the crosshairs of hate-fueled journalists as well. Anyways, she didn't stop there. Michaela is now the CEO of Luminate Enterprises, which handles all of her father's business. And before you go cry nepotism, you have to keep in mind, she helped her dad cultivate his millions upon millions of viewers, listeners, and readers. So no, she wasn't just handed an enterprise, she helped build it. Although, she still set the bar higher. Michaela, yet again, continued to push herself by choosing to follow her father into the intellectual battlefield and started the Michaela Peterson podcast. Since then, she just keeps leveling up. Michaela has become a highly skilled public speaker, having talked about health on many stages including TED in Oxford. In the cherry on top, she accomplishes all all of this while being a mother. If this video has sparked intrigue and you'd like to hear more from these two, you can find them both on their self-titled respective YouTube channels, which I'll link in the description below. And I can't believe I'm about to do this without a promo code, but these two are heading out on a world tour. And before Jordan takes the stage to talk about mental fortitude, Michaela will be opening and talking about physical fortitude. And you can find tickets and dates at www.jordanbpeterson.com. So Jordan and Michaela, if by any chance you see this video, and maybe anybody watching can help me by tagging at Jordan B. Peterson and at Michaela Peterson below, I'd like to thank you. Because Michaela, you're a force to be reckoned with and watching your journey from illness to success has been truly inspiring. And Jordan, 
If it weren't for your work, I'd still be living a cowardly lifestyle and molding myself to those around me. You've single-handedly convinced me that my inability to be normal is a blessing, not a curse. So thank you to both of you for being the true definition of a hero.